Okay, we've all had lunch. We've all been notified of the benefits of exercise. We need to move around. So I am here to introduce our next speakers, or presenters, I think is actually more accurate. Uh, I will just say right up front that both David Zid and Jackie Russell did graduate from the Ohio State University, although not necessarily in the same year or in the same field. So that's the professional part of it. I wanted to tell you that about a year and a half or two years ago, a member of our Charlottesville Parkinson's support group told me he'd found this wonderful exercise program called Delay the Disease. And uh, so he is the one who actually introduced me to their program, Delay the Disease, wonderful exercise program for people with Parkinson's. Uh, it was my good fortune to meet David Zinn and Jackie Russell at a conference, and I have been very fortunate to have crossed paths with them many times since then. Um, with so much interest in and supportive evidence of the uh, benefits of, of exercise, and as we now know, activity, an active life, uh, is kind of a logical progression that, that we would now have uh, somebody who's giving us the, where the rubber meets the road, sort of. And so um, I would say that with all the evidence and, and supportive uh, data that, who knows? Maybe it actually can delay the disease. But I think you're going to be very pleased, and I want you to sit up and pay attention, and don't, don't be drowsy or anything, because we've just had lunch. But this is, this is worth staying up for. So David and Jackie. Thank you, Susan. Can everybody hear all right in the back in the corners? Um, first of all, I commend everybody for choosing to come to a conference that lasts nearly all day. I, I think it's difficult to sit all day. I find that. And so if you're thinking, you know, I just got a little lunch under my belt, now's the time to close my eyes for a few minutes, don't even go there. Um, you know, when, when I was little, my mom always used to say, as soon as I was done eating lunch, you know, I wanted to get right back in the pool in the summertime. She'd say, no, 15 minutes before you get in the pool. Sit there for 15 minutes and let your food digest. I'm the 15 minutes. And then you're going to be up and moving. So, you know, get ready. I like to start this little chat with um, a talk about heroes. And so I like to get a hero that's sort of local, and I couldn't figure out who the Virginia hero was, and so I thought you guys were just steeped in history, and I thought perhaps your hero was George Washington or Abe Lincoln, or perhaps it's Martin Luther King. If you're a scientist, maybe it's Albert Einstein. If you're an athlete, maybe it's Mia Hamm. Or if you dislike Paul Newman, maybe it's Paul Newman. <laughs> if you have kids, it's got to be Fred Rogers. And if you're a bodybuilder or you're a governor, maybe it's Arnold. But you know what? If you live in the central Ohio area, well, actually now if you live anywhere in Ohio and you have Parkinson's or you're involved in the Parkinson's community, David Zid's the hero because he inspires energy and hope and gives you the idea that Parkinson's is a very manageable disease. It's not something that has to define you anymore. There's no audio with this. I just want you to take a look at this gal. She's a good friend of ours. And I'm sure you've all seen those symptoms before. David Zid and I are here today because we are passionate about the topic that exercise can remarkably affect the symptoms of Parkinson's disease in a positive way. Now, by profession, I'm a nurse, and uh, I'm a scientist. But my nature is I'm a skeptic, and I just don't believe anything until I see it happen. So as a nurse, when I was presented with this, exercise can change the course of a disease, I certainly didn't believe it. So I read every piece of research out on it and, and looked at all the data, and you know, I was still skeptical because I can read as much as anyone can, and I am still a non-believer until I see it happen. 
Well, David and I have seen it happen. We have five exercise classes in Columbus. David trains Parkinson's one-on-one, -on -one, and we have seen people's lives change. We have one husband of an exercise class participant that has stood up and said, you know, exercise gave me my wife back. She was old before her time. The only thing she has changed is adding exercise and look at her. I loved Judy Cameron's talk. I, I just can't get over it. That monkey and rat talk uh, enamored me. As a researcher, I too look at the monkey studies and the rat studies, and so when I asked these rats and monkeys if I could photograph them, they were all anxious to get their little piece of glory, but you know, the animal rights people told me HIPAA was involved and I had to protect their privacy, so I slapped some um, blindfolds on them. You know, that one guy cut his out at the last minute. But anyway, if I were talking to a group of monkeys and rats, as we learned this morning, I could say beyond a shadow of a doubt, this will change your brain. It will make you better. It will change the course of the disease. Exercise every day. But I'm not talking to animals. Does this translate to the humans that have Parkinson's? Is there a double-blinded, homogeneous, non-randomized study in the human population that proves this beyond a shadow of a doubt? Yes. Not yet. <laughs> but there's going to be. I'm confident. But don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you from exercising and trying it now. I can tell you what human research has proven to us in a nutshell, and it's not going to be a long-winded talk about this, but this is important. First of all, task-specific exercises seem to help more. When, when I say task-specific, look at your symptoms. What do you have trouble with? Freezing, your, your gait stride, your voice, balance, exercise, with the idea that that's the symptom you want to combat, so find those exercises. Gait training improves with cueing. What that means is if you want to walk better, somebody needs to cue you in some way, either visually or, th or through saying something, or you need to cue yourself. That will help your gait. Human studies show, and this is a new one, strength training is good for Parkinson's. Years ago, they, they did not think strength, strength training was appropriate for Parkinson's. Now it's been proven in a research paper that it helps with balance and it prevents falls. So go ahead and lift some weights. Daily exercise optimizes function. The key word there is daily. Do something every single day. This is what the research has shown. Just like Judy said this morning, if you do it every day, it seems that you get the most robust results in your symptoms. Lastly, and most importantly, right now, Exercise and physical therapy should be a standard of care for physical for Parkinson's disease. You should have it as a frontline treatment. I'm all about science and research, but you know, David and I are really much more about hope and inspiration. I'm stealing some words from Randy Pausch. He wrote a book called The Last Lecture. That book is about living your life in the face of adversity. And if any of you have read it, he talks about what inspiration does for him. And he defined it as the ultimate tool for helping another individual to achieve their maximum potential. You have a maximum potential with Parkinson's disease. You just need to be inspired to achieve it. Exercise can put you in charge of your own morale. It gives you something to do when you want to do it to help yourself. You don't have to wait for the clock to tick and take your cinnamon. You can do this now and see the results now. You can't change the cards you're dealt, but you can sure play the way, change the way you play them. And that's what exercise can do for you if you have Parkinson's. Exercise is your trump card. I was so excited to hear that Judy Cameron works uh, in Pittsburgh with Michael Zygmunt because I have stolen this quote from him recently. It's now one of my new favorite quotes. He says, one could argue the more important objective research in moving towards the development of drugs that are neuroprotective, that is, medication that may delay or reverse the progression of the disease, we believe that exercise is likely such a drug. 
I read that quote and I called David and I was doing the happy dance because I knew this slide was coming up. I am a 46 year old who was diagnosed with Parkinson's about five years ago and um, I wanted to do everything I could to um, take care of myself now and a friend of mine was um, working out da at David's gym and mentioned to me that he had a focus on Parkinson's. This is my husband Don, he's 76 years old and um, I'm going to talk with for him today. He's having a little bit a little bit of trouble with his medication, and he's not feeling like talking. Uh, I'm sure that he would say that he's sitting here today uh, because he was has been so inspired by David Zid. David has, I think, performed miracles with Don. Hi, my name is Kathy Cooper. I'm 62 years old. And I have had Parkinson's probably in 1997. I noticed a slight tremor in my right hand. But I, di I dismissed it because I thought That's, that can't be anything serious. However, by 2003, the tremors were getting worse. The symptoms were definitely getting worse. So I made an appointment with a local neurologist and he diagnosed me with Parkinson's. Uh, by day, I'm a nurse in a surgery center, but I really think this Parkinson's project that David and I have going is my destiny. I get no greater joy from any of the nursing jobs I've ever done than working with this group of people, because you can change their life. You can change their attitude, and you can give them hope. A couple of things have happened to me personally and to David that directed us here. And, you know, I want to just tell you briefly why we're so involved and why we believe in this so much. In 1982, I met the very first person I ever had that had Parkinson's. She was my mother-in-law, Mary Russell. You see her here. She's holding my kids on her lap. And uh, she had a very debilitating form of this disease. It taught me what the caregiver has to do and how much work it is. I spent a lot of time caring for her. And uh, she actually succumbed to this disease. But you know, she taught me uh, never to lose your optimistic attitude, and she never did. And so I wanted to figure out a way to help other people stay optimistic. My next brush with the disease is with this man. He is the driving force and inspiration behind Delay the Disease. His name is Thomas Mallory. He's an orthopedic surgeon in Columbus, Ohio that was a pioneer for hip replacement. He brought the surgery to Columbus from England. He created a specialty surgery practice in total joints only before that was even thought of. He was a dynamic individual, AAA, never stopped working, highly organized. Patients loved him. I worked for him for about 13 years and watched Parkinson's disease rob him of his career. And um, as an incredibly busy man that could be halted by this, it, it just, it really made an impact on me. He was an exercise enthusiast his entire life. He ran marathons, he played polo. And um, when he retired, he sort of dropped off the face of the earth. And I didn't see him for about two years. He called me one day and he said, Jackie, you've been doing some research for me, you've done some writing, I have a project for you, would you help me? Well, I couldn't wait to see him again. When he retired, he was very typical with his Parkinson's symptom, bad tremor, voice was very weak, posture was terrible. I saw him after two years and he was very different, posture was erect. He was strong with his voice, his tremor was negligible, and I looked at him and I said, what have you been doing? He said, that's what I want to talk to you about. I have a friend that's been training me, his name's David. I want to introduce you to him, and I want you to partner with him, but I don't know if I believe this yet. All I've changed is exercise. This was five years ago, and he is a researcher. He said, do a literature search, find everything out there written. Let's see if there's something founded in this, or am I just lucky? Back then, I found enough articles to support his cause, and he said, meet David. Help him write this down. Maybe folks in Columbus, Ohio can be as lucky as I have been. So I meet David, who's twice my size. And he has a smile that takes up his whole face, and he looks me straight in the eye, and he is convinced that this works. And he said, I know we can do this. 
So we sat down at my kitchen table and hammered this out, never, not realizing what we were doing, and created this Parkinson-specific fitness program called Delay the Disease. Our product found endorsement from lots of movement disorder neurologists, and uh, we had an exercise class dropped into our laps five years ago from The Ohio State University. It had four people, and it was in a church basement. We added David. That's like creating a party. We had balloons and music, and we grew the class, and it outgrew the church basement. And then we went to another room, and it outgrew that room, and we had 60, 70 people in one class. Because they found camaraderie, they found fun, and they found improvement. We now have five exercise classes in Columbus, um, one every day of the week, and uh, we have a lot of fans that believe this works. And the thing that impresses me about David is he cares. He really cares about us. I'm sure he cares about all of his people that he trains, but his passion is this Parkinson's disease workout. The difference with, I think, this program and working with David, besides his enthusiasm, is that he has such um, a wide experience with a whole uh, people with Parkinson's at all levels that he brings what others can't. Um, and then he uses that um, experience to develop something that fits me. David has just such a great personality. Always shakes hands. First thing when you walk in the door, you get that big smile, how are you? Shakes hands with everybody that comes in the door. And it never stops. He's just uh, full of energy and humor and optimism. And that's so rewarding and helpful to everybody I'm sure he comes in contact with. I don't have to belabor this slide because Judy had a whole speech on it, but neuroplasticity is the word you should take away as your new, new vocabulary word today. It means the brain can change. It's plastic. It doesn't matter what age you are. And as she educated me today, uh, as you age, you get more benefit from exercises. Your brain is more plastic, more moldable. What I have found is this miracle grow growth factor that exercise causes changes your brain chemistry. And that's what we see results in our class with. The newest recommendations uh, are to exercise beyond what you would self-select. In other words, have someone push you. That seems to result in more dramatic changes in your symptoms. Initiate this early in your diagnosis if you can. It, it will maybe stem the change of your symptoms, perhaps reverse them, but it's never too late to start, and it's never too early. He always has something that we're supposed to work on all week. And that's the first thing he asks, that's the next thing he says when he comes in on Friday that the next week is, well, did you work on it? <laughs> One of the good things about working out with David is that he can push you, but he's fun and he makes you laugh and, and he tells jokes and he gives you the opportunity to share. And um, quite frankly, um, he's the only person that I've ever worked out with that I get up at 6 a.m. on Saturdays and go. <laughs> And we went every Friday at 11 o'clock. Boy, we were certainly there. Because the first day we went, we were so inspired by all the people who were leaving the class. They were all saying, wow, do, what, what's this guy doing to us? How he's helping us. They were just almost surreal, the whole thing, was how much help and how much they had gained that day from the exercise class. It, it continued on, on and on. but. The class just kept getting bigger and bigger. More people came. The word was getting around that there was this great guy, David Zid, performing miracles, I think, with Parkinson's patients. You know, I think our class participants say it better than I do, but um, we want to have our own little research support for this program as well. And so we're in the process of collecting our own data with the help of Ohio State and their physical therapy department so that soon I'll be able to say, here's the results from our classes. And it will give a little bit more believability to it, although if you see these folks, you'll believe it. You know, David and I have been on the speaker circuit. We've been all over the country and met all kinds of great people. And um, one of the places was the Muhammad Ali Center in Phoenix. So if you're going to retire, go there.
You can do just about anything in the whole wide world there because they have a lot of money at the Muhammad Ali Center. But what interests me the most is their new study that's going on right now. And actually, I just heard from Daryl and O'Donnell, who's this gal that you see in the picture. They've just finished collecting data on this study. It's called a pole striding study. They're exercising people with walking poles for an hour, three hours a week, for 12 weeks. And their measurement tools are not only the standard, can you walk better, is your stride longer, um, is your posture more erect? Was your balance better? They're measuring people, humans, with PET scanning, which is what we learned about this morning. So I think this is going to be one of the first studies that says in the human population, absolutely brain chemistry changes with exercise. Don't wait another minute before you start. I have to show you a few more faces of the folks in our classes. You know, they're my friends now. They're my inspiration because they come every single day on wheeled walkers, on, in wheelchairs. Some of them walk in like, like they don't even have the disease. They're farmers. They're physicists. They're surgeons. They're nurses. They're homemakers. They're teachers. Every one of them shares one thing. They're driven to change their disease. They just want to be normal. And that's what this can do for you. If you do something every day. David and I have spent a lot of time uh, going to conferences to educate ourselves from the researchers in the country that are just phenoms at this. And Mark Hirsch and Becky Farley are two of them. I know you can't read much of this slide, but um, this paper that was recently written supports community-based exercise programs, which is what we're all about. It goes over the rat study and how it's certainly proven in the animal population. And then it talks about translating that to healthcare providers so that you can have a community-based exercise program everywhere. If this is going to be standard of care, if you're going to walk in your doctor's office and get a prescription for your Cinemet or whatever drugs you're on and a prescription for physical therapy, you're started. But when your physical therapy runs out, which it will, then what are you going to do? If you're driven, you'll do it on your own. If you're not, you need to look for a community-based exercise program. And this paper says they should be everywhere. Because of that, because of when we would speak, we would get this request, could we have a David Zid in our area? We created a continuing education class for healthcare professionals, PTs, OTs, trainers, nurses, can all get 10 continuing ed credits with this program. Um, we're traveling this program. We've given it in Columbus. We're going to give it in Toledo in November, Columbus in December. We're traveling it all over the country because if we can educate more people to become Parkinson specific, you'll have these tools to have uh, a resource for a Parkinson specific exercise program and therapy. We teach in this class how to get a class going. Where do you start? Where does your money come from? What's your liability? What size room do I need? Who should the instructor be? And then a huge piece of it is train the trainer. We go through every symptom and every exercise. Our next book is soon to come out. It's called Functional Fitness. I'm pretty excited about this book. It's a DVD as well. And it goes over activities of daily living that you might struggle with and then gives you a toolbox of exercises that can help with that particular activity of daily living. How am I going to get out of the bed when I um, am stiff at night? We give you exercises to help with that and techniques to do it. Getting out of the car, getting up off the floor independently after you've stumbled and fallen. These are things our exercise class participants said to us. Help us with this stuff. So we developed all these things. And you know what? Doesn't everyone still want to go to the football game and move about in a crowd? We have ideas to help you with that. Freezing, balance. So watch for this. This is our trick to get someone to exercise at home every day for 10 minutes. I call it the handwriting challenge. David and I noticed handwriting was improving in our class with general large movement big muscle exercises, not necessarily fine motor dexterity exercises. And so we threw this challenge out to our exercise class, and now I throw it out to everyone that goes to our website. You can download these forms on our website, which is delaythedisease.com. Um, we have a theory that your handwriting can improve with 10 minutes a day of large muscle big movement exercises. And there's four exercises that take 10 minutes to do, and you do them every day for 12 weeks, and we give you a piece of paper to sample your handwriting. See if it works. 
and I'm getting these back now. I started this about 12 weeks ago. I'm starting to get these back in the mail. All the directions are on the forms. Um, some handwriting improves and some doesn't. But you know what? There's so many people out there that are now exercising every day for 10 minutes, and I get notes at the bottom of the page. And my handwriting hasn't changed that much, but guess what? The card club ladies think I'm standing taller, and I'm moving better, so I'm going to keep doing those 10 minutes. I'm not the one you're here for. The 15 minutes is up, and it's time to get moving. And so I want to close this with a couple pictures of my two daughters who are finding their own destiny, and I encourage them as they get out of college to look for something that they are as passionate about as I am with this, and choose that and do that the rest of your life. But I'm really impressed with the book. I'm impressed with the DVD. I'm impressed with David. And I'm just impressed with the whole program. And I just thank the Lord. I say my prayers. I'll say thank the Lord that we've got David. The benefit for me in training with David has been my um, outlook on the disease. Um, I'm much more positive, I think, than I probably would have been. I don't, um, while I think about the future, I don't. Um, think about it probably with as much uh, dread or fear because I know I'm taking care of myself now for the future. In fact, I'm getting my life back. I'm, there are many, many people that say, you have Parkinson's? You're kidding. So that, is, that says a lot for David because most people, when they first meet me, have no idea that I have Parkinson's. And I want to keep it that way. That's why I'm sticking with this man. So I'm, uh, he can't leave us. He just can't. <laughs> and so I'd like to introduce to you the guy you came to hear, David Zid, my partner and friend. That last picture was Kathy Cooper before she started exercising. Is that amazing? The only thing she changed in her life was exercise. Now she warms up our class. And she taught class yesterday when we weren't there. Only thing she's changed is exercise. I've got good news and bad news. What do you guys want? Well, I don't really care what you want. You know, the good news is everyone in this room can see some type of improvement just like Kathy Cooper did. She improved her life through exercise and everyone in this room can do the same thing. You can improve your life with exercise. You want to hear the bad news? Kathy did a hundred squats every single day. So let's everyone get up and do a hundred squats. No, I'm just kidding. There is no bad news. Think about that. You know, Parkinson's disease tends to take things from you, right? You know, you've been walking your whole life. You don't think about walking, but now you've got to think about walking. Or you've been getting out of chairs your whole life, and now you've got to think about getting out of a chair. You know, I, I think a good word is Parkinson's disease tends to take away your stature. Is that, is that a good word to use, your stature? Because, you know, you guys have seen this before, right? The walk the shuffle, the stoop posture. You know, I'm here to tell you, you can change this. And I'm going to show you how to do it right now. And tonight you can go home and you can start fighting Parkinson's disease. It's that easy. You guys want to see a few things? Sure. Is anyone cold? Yeah. It's cold in here, isn't it? Yeah. Not for long. <laughs> you know, we know when we practice big movements, we get bigger movements. And so everything that you're doing, the small handwriting, the small steps, the things that are, that are taking away your stature, if we practice big movements over and over and over, guess what gets better? All these small things get better. And you start moving bigger, and your handwriting gets better, and things improve. So. Um, I, I think there's a sheet in your, in your um, folder. I think it's pink. And on the back side, there's three exercises on there. Why don't we go through those, shall we? You know, Jackie and I speak at a lot of places, 
And I, I said, you know, Jackie, I think when we leave, no one remembers us. What can we do to get people doing something? So we thought, you know, let's give them three things to do. And these are three things that you can do right here, right now. You can do it in your home. You don't need any equipment. And guess what? It, it works. So let's scoot back from the edge of your table. Let's just scoot back a little bit. We're going to sit on the edge of your chair. OK? We'll sit right on the edge of your chair. Excuse me. So the first one's a rope pull. And all we're going to do is we're going to grab an imaginary rope, and we're going to pull it to the floor. OK? So today, everyone works to their own tolerance level. OK? So everyone works to what you can do. Don't do what you shouldn't do. All right? Don't throw food at other people. You shouldn't do that. Let's grab an imaginary rope and pull it to the floor. Let's go one to the left. Let's grab one to the right and pull to the floor. We go back to the left, pull it to the floor. Back to the right, pull it to the floor. So we're alternating, aren't we? Right, left, right, left. We think there's something about alternating movements that is good for the brain. OK? How high can you go? Up and all the way down. Up, all the way down. Exaggerate this move. Make this as big as you possibly can. Oh, and don't forget to breathe. OK, breathing is good. OK, that's a piece of cake, isn't it? What's number two on the list? A hamstring stretch, right? OK, so we're already on the edge of the chair. Let's just put one leg out in front of you. One leg goes straight. The heel is on the floor. Let's put both hands above your knee. And we're just going to push your belly button towards your toe. Let me see if I can do this up here. Excuse me. So it kind of looks like this. If I'm here, I'm going to push my belly button towards my toe. OK? You should feel something in the back of your upper leg. If you're not feeling that, you're not doing it right. Relax and breathe. So whenever we stretch, we relax and breathe. OK? If you go into a stretch and go, I'm really going to get a lot out of this stretch, you're not going to get much out of it. Relax. Breathe out and relax. Let me ask you a question. Could you do this hamstring stretch when you're drinking your coffee in the morning? Could you? Your breakfast table? Why don't you put your foot up on another chair? Drink your coffee and get a hamstring stretch at the same time. Could you do that? Piece of cake, right? How about, could you do a rope pull while you're brewing your coffee? You can do a rope pull standing up, can't you? OK, so, oh, I'm sorry. So you, you brew your coffee, you do a rope pull. You drink your coffee, you're doing a hamstring stretch, right? And you're already starting to fight Parkinson's disease. Did it take any more time? No. That's what's cool about this. The third thing on that list, we're just going to do a hamstring stretch on one. Do you guys want to do one side or two sides? Should we just get flexible on one side and leave the other side alone? OK, let's, let's switch legs then, OK? Let's get the other leg out there. It's straight, and we're going to push your belly button towards your toe. Heel goes to the floor. Heel is on the floor. You should feel something in the back of your leg. Feel pretty good? Should feel pretty good. OK, so what's our third thing? Getting out of a chair, right? You know, I think so many people have problems getting out of a chair. And this is pretty typical of Parkinson's disease. You know, you go, I can't get out of a chair. And I used to do it all the time. You know, with Parkinson's, we know if we break things down into smaller steps, they become easy again. So getting out of a chair, we just break it down into three steps. The same three steps every time you get out of a chair. We're going to scoot to the edge of your chair. You guys should already be there. Right? Ah, gotcha. So we're on the edge of your chair. You're going to go feet wide. And your feet are going to be underneath you. OK? Your feet are underneath you. Now, I call it nose over toes. toes. Try to get your head all the way over your, your feet and come on up. Just step and just, just come on up. Don't hit your head on the table. You may have to get your, your seat away from the table. If you haven't been able to get out of a chair, try this. We usually get a few people that can get out of a chair that haven't been able to do that in a while. Am I going in and out? OK. How'd that work? 
So three steps. Move to the edge of your chair. Feet are wide underneath you. Nose over toes. And we just stand right up. Boom. Right? Easy? So if you're having problems getting out of a chair, just do those three things and it's going to help get up. You have to think about it, though. Should we do a couple more? Let's come on up again. Scoot to the edge. Feet are wide, nose over toes, up and down. What are we doing, by the way? Yeah, we're exercising. We're squatting, aren't we? <laughs> what a bad word that squat is, isn't it? Could, let me ask you another question. Could you do maybe two or three of these every time you sit down or stand back up? How many of these would you get in in a day if you did that? Wow. Does it take any extra time? You know, let, let's, let's stand up and do one of my all-time favorite things. I bet you guys are curious about my all-time favorite thing, aren't you? OK, since we're going to go for a five-mile run right now. No. You know, I just call them arm circles. And all we do is just always get in a big flex T. So arms are out. And we're just squeezing your shoulder blades together. OK? And we're going to do five as big as you can circles forward. All right? If you give someone a black eye, you may have to go home with them tonight. Let's do five as big as you can forward and five as big as you can backwards. Is this a big movement? You know it. You know what this does for you? Did, it, did everyone see what happened when everyone stood up and we pinched our shoulder blades together? What happened? Oh, everyone stood up a little straighter, and you're taller. So the money back guarantee about getting taller today is safe. <laughs> Everyone's a little bit taller, right? This also helps your shoulder joint. Movement is great for joints. It encourages synovial fluid back in a joint. Naturally occurring fluid, it's good for your joints. So let's change the effect on this in our joints. Let's go palms up. And let's make as big of a circle as you can. This is tight. I should have brought my goggles. Oops. <laughs> big oh, ones. Sorry. That's a high five, actually. <laughs> big ones forward and big ones backwards, pinching the shoulder blades together. Sorry. That's perfect. That's a great big circle, then. <laughs> if you're knocking over your drinks, that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm sorry to the Holiday Inn staff. OK, so palms are up. Was that a little different than before? Let's change it one more time. Let's go thumbs down and give me five as big as you can circles. Pinching the shoulder blades, making them as big as you can. Forward for five and backwards for five. Does it matter how fast you go? No. Big as you can. Let me ask you a question. If you put your toast in the toaster, could you do these arm circles? Could you? Could you do this in your kitchen? You got it. It's a big movement. You know, so before you even eat breakfast, you've done a rope pull, a hamstring stretch. What else did we do? Stand and sit, and big arm circles. Wait till you see what I have for dinner, you guys. <laughs> did this take any extra time? Why wouldn't you do this? If these four things you can do before breakfast helps you start fighting Parkinson's disease, it's a no-brainer in my opinion. Don't you think? Is that Did I just get turned off? Did you guys turn me off already? <laughs> that usually happens in another five minutes. But think about that. Every day, push yourself a little further in what you can do. Every day. And it's easy to do. This is what you're going to do tomorrow morning, right? or tonight, or whenever you do choose to do it, it takes no time at all. It doesn't take any time out of your day to do this. And you start fighting this disease. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's grab a seat. Actually, let's stand back up. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mixed, mixed up. Oh. Should we sit down? Is anyone tired? 
Oh, you are hard to fool. You know, just sitting is a form of exercise. We already know that. And more activity is better, isn't it? Yes. Just think about this. You know, what I hear a lot is that I'm not in control anymore. Parkinson's has me. I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over. Exercise puts you back in control. You're managing this disease now. It's not managing you. You manage it. And I've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times. It works. It works. And you just have to believe me. You know, the worst thing that happens is if you do these four exercises, your toast gets burnt, maybe. <laughs> right? Wow. Think about that. You know, let me ask you another question. Could you do arm circles in a bank line? <laughs> huh? Could you? Sure you could. You might get shot. Well, if they clear the bank out, then you're first in line, aren't you? The idea is that you don't need anything to exercise. You can do this. It can become part of your day. Just make it part of your day. If you walk around with me for a whole day, I'm walking backwards, sideways. I'm talking on the phone while I'm standing on one foot. I'm incorporating stuff in my day. It doesn't take me any more time, does it? That's pretty cool. Do you have to get dressed up and go to the gym? No. no. Is it great to go to the gym? Yeah. Sure, it's great. But if you're not going to the gym, don't. Start exercising at home, though. Or in the bank line. Let's stand up. No joke now. You know, I walk around for a reason. I love walking. And you guys might forget who I am, but you're going to go, I don't know, there's some crazy guy walking around the whole time. But why do I walk? You know, I, I think walking is one of the most important things in our lives. If I'm able to walk from here to there, am I independent? I don't need much help, do I? And that's where I want to get everyone in this room. If you're not independent, let's get you back. If you are independent, let's keep it for as long as you possibly can or for the rest of your life. Walking is a big deal. Can, let me ask you a question. Can, you know, I ask lots of questions, don't I? I don't up. expect answers, though. What's that? Keep it up. Keep it up. <laughs> can you move without balance? Who said yes? There's always one. Where is that? You can't. So let's practice some balance. Let's, if you came here with someone, let's have one person work today and one person be the spotter today. OK? You can stand in front of the person. You can stand behind them. You can stand to their side. Let's have one person work and one person spot. All right? And let's practice some balance. Are we ready? We're going to put both feet together. Both feet are together. And we're going to cross your arms across your chest. So here we are. One person is spotting. So the spotter is going to be like this, right? Ready to catch someone. Now, you're getting balance from the ball arch complex of your foot. The bottom of your foot have more nerve endings there than anywhere in your body except your tongue and your fingertips. It's number three on the list. That's a pretty important place for nerves, isn't it? Well, you're also getting balance from your eyes. So let's, let's test and see how good you are without your eyes. Let's look up at the ceiling. And we'll look down at the floor. Look to the left. Look to the right. Was that pretty easy? Everyone passed that one? OK, let's put one foot slightly in front of the other one. Arms go out now. Arms go out. I'm going to squeak by you. Is that OK? Sorry. Arms are out, one foot in front of the other. Spotters, get ready. Find your sweet spot. Let's look up at the ceiling. Down at the floor. Look right, look left. Now, if you're holding on to something, how much balance are you going to get out of that? Not very much. I had a guy come to me two weeks ago. He goes, Ziddy. By the way, everyone calls me Ziddy, right? That's where Ziddy comes from. He goes, Ziddy, 
I'm doing this every single day and I'm not getting any better. I go, what are you doing? So he showed me. He's grabbing a wall and he's, and he's standing on one foot. I go, I, I solved your problem. You can't hold on to anything when you're practicing your balance. You have to push yourself beyond what you can normally do. Now, are we going to do this out in a busy street? Who said yes? Did someone say yes again? They're coming back from this corner. If a bus is coming at you and you're in the middle of a street, what do you do? Get out of the way, right, good. Okay, we've got that down then. Do we, can we practice balance in a corner in your house where if you fall, you fall into your corner? That'd be a good spot. How about where your countertop makes a corner? In your kitchen, right after you had breakfast and exercise. Could you do this right in your corner? You got it. Do this in a safe place. Let's switch feet. Let's go the other foot in front. Let's make this a little tougher now. Spotters, get ready. Let's cross the arms across your chest. OK? Find your sweet spot. Let's look up. Look down. Look right. Look left. 100%? Is that where we were? Are we doing 100% here? That's pretty good. OK, I'll tell you what. Since we have five more hours of this, <laughs> let's do one more toughie, OK? Let's go arms out, and let's try standing on one foot. Oh, the room just got warmer, didn't it? See what you can, as long as it takes me to talk. <laughs> you could be here for a long time. You know, what we try to do is, if this is difficult, just if you can hold for a second and come back down. If you're good at it, we shoot for about 30 seconds to a full minute. Not kidding. So we're standing on one foot. How would we make this harder? Crossing the arms, maybe? How about looking up and looking down and looking right and looking left? Oh, now no one's breathing, right? But again, you don't need any equipment for this. Do you think? Do you think if you stood on one foot for 30 seconds, you stood on the other foot 30 seconds, you think you'd be a good walker or it'd help your walking? You know it. Could everyone in this room practice this tonight when you go home? Could you? OK, I'm going to call you tonight then. You guys want to grab a seat for a second? Oh, cool. <laughs> So if we practice balance, and that can help our walking, what happens if, because we get a lot of this in Columbus, if we're frozen. Does anyone have freezing issues here? You just can't move? Or you just can't step big? Here, here's a couple freezing tips for you, OK? Um, the first thing is, is we know, you know if your first step is small, guess what? All the other ones are small. If your first step is big, guess what? All your other ones tend to be big. So try to make your first step big. You guys want to do an experiment? Oh, cool. That's that same guy. <laughs> Giving me troubles, and now he's helping me. I, need, I owe you some money or something. Um, well, since we like standing and sitting, why don't we stand up and do this one? Let's look at each other right now, OK? Let's look at each other. So here's the experiment. Let's clench your teeth and push your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Come on, clench your teeth like you're mad. And let's swing your arms big. Swing your arms, alternate. Left, right, as big as you can. Swing them, swing them. Big, come on, clench your jaw. Don't slap anyone. <laughs> OK, so. Let's unclench your teeth, relax your jaw, relax your tongue, swing your arms. Do you guys see anything? Easier. Easier. Does it look smoother? So if I'm frozen, do I get more tense to move or should I relax to move? 
Oh, you guys are, can you travel with me? <laughs> so the first tip when you're frozen is try to relax. If a bus is coming at you, what do you do? Scream. Get out of the way. How many times is a bus coming at you? Rare. So if I'm stuck in that bank line and I can't move, is anyone going to die behind me? No. Will they? So if you get more anxious, you're not going to be able to move. Anyway, so you might as well try to relax. The easiest way that I know to relax your whole body is to relax your jaw and relax your tongue, and the rest of your body will follow. Try that. Just relax your jaw, relax your tongue, and then you can take that big first step, right? That's how we do it. Okay, now, for real, do you want to sit there or do you want to stay standing? Let's grab a seat. We also know that when you're stuck and you're frozen, instead of trying to move forward, I can't move forward, try to move backwards. Or take a side step and then move forward. Because for whatever reason, that disconnect in your brain for freezing, it's not allowing you to move forward, move a different direction. It works great. I have a guy, he has such bad freezing issues, he goes, taps the floor, and then he starts walking like a dream. Isn't that amazing? So, you know, Parkinson's disease can take things from you, but you can get it right back. And you do it with exercise every single day. This is how you do it. It's not that hard, is it? What about bowling? Bowling? What do you want to do with bowling? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll get you to the line. Everything else is up to you. Um, a second thing for freezing is to try to step over something. Okay, so if you can see something on the ground and step over it, the intention is different. I'm not trying to take a step anymore, I'm stepping over something, and usually that works. Okay, that's where the, the lines on the walkers come in handy, the lasers. That's stepping over something. Your intention is to step over, not to take a step. It's, it's the same thing. Functionally, you move from A to B, don't you? But it's different. The third way, which is what I really like, is counting your steps. So if I count my steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, what did my brain just do? It's counting. It's not thinking about walking. Relax your jaw, relax your tongue, try step counting. Now was it one, two, three, or was it one, two, three? What happens to your voice? Practice your voice. You never want to lose your voice. You have things to say the rest of your life, don't you? Thanksgiving's coming up. If you want that gravy, how are you going to do it? I'll tell you what. Let's do another little experiment. Dude. I love experiments. Since we're all sitting down, let's just bend over. Okay? Let's get hunched over. Chin to your chest, and let's go as loud as you can. Pass the gravy, please. Ready? Pass the gravy. Okay, now let's sit up. Let's pinch the shoulder blades together. Oh, now let's pass the gravy. Here we go. Pass the gravy, please. What was louder? Well, if you want the gravy, you're going to be upright. Practice your voice every day. Practice your voice every day because you have things to say and people want to hear what you have to say the rest of your life. We're running short here? I thought we were here until the rest of the day. Yeah, okay. Okay, five minutes? Okay. Well, we can get about 500 things in here. Um, The idea of, let, 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 let me just tell you a little story. If I spend a day in a pizza shop, whole day in the pizza shop, is that going to kill me one day? No. no. How about if I go to the gym and I exercise my brains out? Is that going to really help me a whole lot one day? No. If I spend 365 days in that pizza shop, what happens? Ooh, bad news. 
Now what if I spend 365 days working out, exercising every day for 365 days? What happens? I look behind me and I go, wow. That's power, you guys. That's power. That's how you get this disease under control. That's how you manage Parkinson's daily, every day. And you guys can do this. You can. You know, there's three ways that people get goals that I've worked with. One, they put it in their book and they do it every single, every single day at the same time. Every single day at the same time. Number two, they put it in their book and they write it in as a, as a, um, a meeting. Someone calls me up and says, hey, Ziddy, can you do something? You know, I got a meeting. That's my workout time. No one else gets it. The third way is to get a workout buddy. Find someone that is going to be accountable. You have to be accountable to two people, you and someone else. Find someone that's going to help you. You know, if you miss out on your workout buddy, what are they going to do? They're going to call you and say, where were you? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, do you have to meet him at the gym? Why don't you meet him in the kitchen for their morning breakfast? Right? You know, here's what we mean. If you move and you move more, guess what happens? You start moving more. Movement begets movement. And that's what happens. You know, one little thing, Lynn Clancher is right there. She has a class at the v near the VA Center. What day of the week? Fridays at 11. It's a group exercise class. Go. Check it out. You know, even if you can't make it every single week, maybe you learn some things and you take them home and you start doing them at home. You know, I've seen people get better and they start taking less meds. You know, if you start doing this every single day, in about four to six months, you're going to be going, I'm getting up the stairs better, I'm getting out of my car better, I'm getting out of a chair better. Whatever it is you're getting better at, you're going to get better. <clears throat> and then about a year from now, when you look behind you, and you've got this huge amount of exercise behind you in little doses, you know, you manage this disease this way. We've seen people completely reverse their symptoms. Kathy Cooper could not get out of a chair by herself. Now she's teaching my exercise class. That's it. That's the deal. So tonight, after I call you, <laughs> you're going to do it every single day, right? If you did arm circles for the next 10 days, do you think your posture would be better? I'll call you in 10 days then. <laughs> Thank you for having us.